right, so good morning, everybody. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. If you're joining us for the first time today, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world through over 50 live, free, interactive broadcasts every single month. So again, it's so nice to have you guys here joining us. Uh, I know for many of you, it's your first few weeks back in the classroom as students and as teachers alike. Uh, it's such a pleasure and privilege to have you guys back in the class and thank you so much for spending it with us. Now, today marks day three of our epic week of wonder. So this is Science Literacy Week. This is Canada's largest science festival. And as part of that, the Canadian Association of Science Leaders have banded together with us to do this epic 20 part program series featuring some of the most amazing virtual program offerings coast to coast to coast. Uh, and so I really appreciate you joining us for this. It is a been a, an absolute thrill, a lot of fun for me personally, and I'm so excited we can get so many of you, 180 classes registered for today's program to join us for today's program. Um, so without further ado, uh, I'm gonna highlight two quick things before we dive in. One is we are gonna be doing a Kahoot quiz at the end of this broadcast. So a few of you might be familiar with this from some of our others to start the month. If you wanna to head to kahoot.it, and use the game pin 722912. We will have a little quiz before the Q&A at the end. I will bring up that game pin before we dive in with the quiz, but check that out for now, and I put it on YouTube as well. Now for today's program, it's pretty special for me. I've had three jobs in the last 10 years. One, I was an educator at Ripley's Aquarium of Canada, Two, I was lucky enough to found Science Literacy Week before the federal government picked it up. And three, I get to work at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants as the VP of Education. And so today, I get to do a job for Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants as part of Science Literacy Week with my former friends at Ripley's Aquarium. And that is a lot of fun and kind of surreal at the same time. We're gonna turn it over to Togi at Ripley's and we are gonna dive in with coral in crisis today. So coral reefs are some of the most biodiverse and amazing parts of not just the ocean, but the entire planet's ecosystem. We're gonna learn a little bit about what makes them so special, some of the threats that are facing them and what we can do to take action to protect them. Without further ado, thank you so much for joining us today, Togi, in front of the awesome rainbow reef exhibit and take us away. Thank you for the introduction, Jesse. Um, and good morning, everyone. Uh, it was a bit sad and gloomy the, on my way to work today. It was raining and the skies were very gray and dark. I hope that the uh, the habitat in front of you guys, Rainbow Reef, can help brighten your morning as well as all of the really brightly colorful colored fish in this in this habitat. Um, just some, or to help, just to warn you guys, uh, maybe halfway through the presentation or through the stream, I will be asking Jesse to switch our can our view to my colleague, colleague Katie, and what she can see, uh, but that'll be later on, halfway through. Um, before we get into the detail of today's stream, I just wanted to do a quick land acknowledgement, so please join me. Now, the Police Aquarium of Canada acknowledges that we are on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, uh, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis people. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13, signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit, and the Williams Treaties, signed with multiple Mississaugas and the Chippewa Band. Today, the meeting, the meeting place of Toronto, also known as the Toronto, meaning the place in the water where the trees are standing, is home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to work on this land. Now, um, I think my friends here were able to um, see that there are new things in the habitat uh, since we started, since we began the stream. Um, first thing I wanted to point out, the obvious, we have two scuba divers in the water, and they are holding with, they are holding two heads of lettuce. Well, each of them are holding a head of lettuce. Um, if you haven't guessed it by now, friends, uh, our scuba divers will be feeding our um, fish in this uh, habitat. <laughs> uh, I want to point this out real quick. A scuba diver, Josh over there, is sitting on the coral, and I'll uh, I'll share why I'm pointing this out in a, in a few moments. Before that, I just wanted to. Um, give quick context or um, information about this habitat. So I'll just put my camera down real quick. Okay. Now, uh, this rainbow reef is the fourth largest uh, habitat in the aquarium. It holds about uh, 200,000 liters of water or um, actually uh, somewhere between 200 to 300,000 liters of water. 
and it is home to about a thousand different species, a thousand uh, total fish, total numbers of fish, and about a hundred different species or hundred different types of fish. Friends, it is very biodiverse. Um, it's highly biodiverse. You'll notice that there are a lot of different types of fish in the exhibit. Um, I'll move here and I'll point cl more closer to our scuba diver friends later on. Uh, I just wanted to mention that for any coral reef, uh, especially uh, one that uh, an Indo-Pacific coral reef that we are trying to mimic, it is very biodiverse. Um, it what the, the word biodiverse means that there are many organisms in total numbers that includes animals and plants and microorganisms in the area or in the ecosystem as well as there should be many different types or many species so it's not just total numbers but also many different types um, that is how that is what scientists would usually look at when they consider an ecosystem to be biodiverse now i'll keep the camera focusing josh over here and hopefully some of our fish uh would understand that it's breakfast time for them. They will soon. They're just a bit excited because there are two different scuba divers and there are two different sources of breakfast. Now, going back to, top, to the topic, um, normally I would share with all of you, with my friends here, uh, information about the fish, but I wanted to stay on topic and I wanted to talk about corals and climate change. Uh, I did want to point out, uh, or I did want to mention as well, if you guys have any questions about the fish, feel free to ask the questions and we'll get back to you with answers. Um, I did want to point out, however, that a lot of these fish in this type of ecosystem in a coral reef, they have really cool adaptations that would help them survive. Uh, one thing that you would notice uh, in just with the view that you can see right now is there are many different colors that these fish have. Uh, each type, they have different colors and their colors will help them camouflage. It'll help them survive. It'll help them hide in the coral reef. Um, another thing that you would notice is that they have an, an unusual shaped body. Um, I like to describe their body as plate-like. It's very wide, but also if you look at it from a different angle, it's very narrow. It's sort of like a plate. <laughs> Um, this body shape will help all of these fish hide or swim in between corals to hide as well from predators. And a lot of these fish, they have really sharp spine that are jut jutting out of their body or that are growing out of their body uh, to help them, to help protect them from predators as well. And sometimes these spines can be venomous. Now, um, to talk about corals, um, and um, let me just share a quick explanation or a de quick definition of corals. Um, let's focus on the coral that is beside Josh over there, the big green coral. Yeah. Now, a coral is actually, or looking at that one green coral, it's actually made up of an animal, uh, an animal called the polyp. It's related to jellyfish and sea anemones. Um, if you want to imagine what a polyp looks like, just think of a jellyfish only upside down and really small or microscopic, and it's colorless. Now, within this animal, within the polyp, there are plant-like organisms called algae that live in their tissues. And that is why corals are very colorful, if you've seen corals in the ocean. Even in the corals that we have here in the aquarium, they are very colorful. Um, again, these plant-like organisms, uh, they, um, they would give corals uh, their color. And also, uh, these plant-like organisms, these algae, they provide corals essential nutrients. Um, since these algae live in the tissues of these polyps, they have a symbiotic relationship. The algae will be providing essential nutrients so that the polyp and overall the coral itself can grow big. And then the polyp will be providing protection for, for the algae. Um, a symbiotic relationship, if you remember from your science classes, it's just a relationship that describes um, the, the benefit that two organisms would get when they live close to each other. And then as another, or to add to this, to the uh, description of the coral, um, these polyps, they can actually form skeletal structures, uh, calcium-based skeletal structures. That's why you'll see that they have very gnarly, they look very gnarly uh, and they look very, they, they, each coral would look different. Each type of coral would look different. Um, I wanted to go back to the fact earlier that uh, to the fact that earlier Josh scuba diver Josh over here was sitting on uh, one of our coral structures, this one right here. Um, Josh can do that in this habitat because the corals in this habitat and the corals throughout the aquarium are actually fake. 
we only have one exhibit or one habitat to live corals, and that is the habitat that Katie, Katie will show you in a bit, but not right now. Um, uh, that's the only uh, habitat where we have live corals. Um, these uh, corals, they're made of non-toxic paint, non-toxic rubber, and cement. And we decided to go with or to make use of fake corals because um, if we take this many coral from the ocean or this much coral from the ocean, it'll be very devastating for the ocean because corals are very important. Uh, and that leads me to the next part of this or uh, of my talk. Um, why are corals important? Well, specifically for fish, corals can sustain fish. Corals are a good source of food and shelter for fish. Approximately 25% of marine life, uh, and that's not just fish, but any, anim any organism in the ocean, but 25% of marine life uh, would rely on coral reefs for their whole life or even for a portion of their life, when, usually when they are younger, and then they'll migrate out or move out of the coral reef. Now, what about for people? Well, um, aside from sustaining marine life, corals can also sustain people. Uh, historically, people like to build communities or societies or the beginnings of societies close to natural resources because they are a lot of food. And it just makes it easier to live when you, when you build communities closer to resources or natural resources, such as a coral reef. Now, there are accounts, uh, historically, there are accounts of indigenous groups of people who've settled by the ocean close to coral reefs. You would find these indigenous groups of uh, people closer to the equator or any, um, any coastline or any shore that is closer to the equator because these types of corals, the ones that I'm showing all of you, are ones that would live, uh, that require or that they need warm water. Um, so yeah, um, a lot of these indigenous groups of people that I'm mentioning, they, you would find them closer to the equator. Say for example, um, indigenous groups of people from the Oceania, or basically indigenous people from Australia and the Torres Strait Islands near, near the north of uh, Australia, uh, indigenous groups of people from Central America, and also some indigenous groups of people from Southeast Asia and South Asia as well. Um, anyway, so these coral reefs, they are co closely tied to the cultures and to the traditions of these indigenous people. And to this day, there are still indigenous people who inhabit the same areas as their ancestors so that they can preserve their culture and their traditions. Um, and aside from being a good source of food for people, corals, uh, corals and coral reef, they, uh, and the ocean itself actually, they provide a lot of ecosystem services or they provide a lot of benefits to us humans. Um, it's easy to feel uh, whenever we're studying, uh, whenever we're learning in science or whenever we're learning about ecosystems it's si in science, it's easy to feel that ecosystems are, uh, not con are disconnected, but that's actually not the case. Ecosystems are all connected. Um, the ocean is connected to the coastal, eco to coastal ecosystems and coastal ecosystems are connected to other ecosystems on land. Um, and yeah, they're all connected and they're all important. Um, when an ecosystem receives pressure from different sources, uh, eventually every other ecosystem that's connected to the, that to another ecosystem will feel the pressure um, eventually. And now this leads me to one um, one of the main topics for today: How does climate change affect corals and coral reefs? Uh, before I talk about this, I would like to ask Jesse if you could uh, switch our view to Katie. Thank you very much, Jesse. Um, yes, and this is Katie, my colleague from the aquarium. Now, the big question is, how does climate change impact corals and coral reefs? Um, before I talk about that, I just wanted to mention that the animals that make up a coral reef, uh, or these reef building corals, they are very sensitive. Uh, they require specific conditions, like I mentioned earlier. It's not just the temperature, even the amount of light that they receive, as well as the depth in uh, where the, the depth uh, in or the depth uh, the water depth, or uh, if it's too shallow or if it's too deep. Uh, they require specific a specific depth depth for them to survive or for them to live, and they also need to anchor themselves onto hard surfaces so that they can grow. Now. There are also natural phenomena that I will mention that could harm corals. Natural phenomena such as um, natural phenomena such as um, a typhoon or a heat wave. 
uh, these natural phenomena they can destroy corals. Um, with climate change, uh, they, these natural phenomena, can, their intensity will increase. Uh, typhoons will be stronger. Uh, some heat waves will be much more warm, very intense. And yep, they are, again, they are going to be very destructive for corals. Also with sea level rise uh, that climate change would bring, with more, with more, with more ice uh, melting, the sea, le sea levels will eventually rise. That can be harmful for corals. Uh, today, I will be focusing on ocean warming and ocean acidification as an effect of climate change. Now, ocean warming is basically when the ocean becomes too hot for too hot or maybe a degree Celsius or maybe two degrees Celsius warmer than it historically is. And for us humans and maybe for other bigger animals, that might not matter much. But for corals, any small change in temperature can be really harmful. And ocean acidification, basically the ocean water, be the ocean becoming too acidic for corals and other animals that form a calcium-based skeleton. Now, with um, how can ocean warming and ocean acidification harm corals? Uh, it can lead to coral bleaching. Coral bleaching is the term that's used by scientists to describe corals when they are in danger. Uh, with coral bleaching, you, uh, the, coral full, the colorful corals that you can see on the screen right now, um, the colorful corals that you can see on the screen right now with coral bleaching, they will turn stark white or they, they would look like they've been bleached, hence the term coral bleaching. And that is a sign that they are in danger. I did want to mention that coral bleaching is not permanent. It's something that corals can recover from, but it is also a sign that they are in danger. Um, Corals can recover from coral bleaching if they get enough time and if the conditions around them go back to normal. But if it doesn't go back to normal, if it doesn't become habitable for them again, uh, they will just be in really deep trouble. Um, that's what we're noticing nowadays. Uh, with a lot of the coral bleaching events that you've probably heard of, that's mainly be uh, that's because of the um, all of the uh, heat waves that we've we've been we've been receiving, all of the all of the um, unusually strong typhoons that we are hearing about. All of those can le are are leading to the coral bleaching that we are hearing about nowadays. Now, what can we do to help? Um, we are in any of uh, in any uh, stream or any 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 time we talk here at the aquarium. We always want to talk about conservation and helping uh, helping um, corals and, and other animals out and marine life out in general. Um, how can we how can we help or what can we do to help? Uh, before I go into details about this, I just wanted to mention that helping out may look different depending on where you live in the world, on where you are, and it can also look different on a personal basis. There is no, uh, there are a lot of ways to help out, but depending on where we live, it might uh, doing certain things might be better. Um, and also, we need to consider the things that what the things that we can do right now. Anyway, um, in regards to helping corals and coral reef out. For corals that are significant, for corals that are significant to the indigenous people and their land, um, government agencies have actually taken a collaborative approach with these indigenous groups of people, as taking care of taking care of nature and respecting nature and their surrounding has always been woven into the cultures and tradition of indigenous groups of people. Um, they know how to take care of. Um, of the nat of the natural resources that are around them because they've been living with these natural resources for such a long period of time um now this has not this is not the case for every part of every coral reef in the ocean in the world but i think uh, i personally think that this is something that um, any coral reef manager should uh, work uh, should try and um, include whenever they think about um, helping corals out or managing coral reefs um, also, I wanted to mention that the government, certain governments are actually trying to create artificial reefs. A good example would be, uh, I believe, the effort that New York City uh, recently tried to under undertake. Uh, New York City, uh, I believe, donated a few, a few old subway trains um, and donated a few old subway trains to be turned into artificial corals or uh, artificial reefs. And a good thing about this is that the subway trains are big enough to not be taken by ocean currents and corals can properly anchor on these subway trains. Uh, there are unfortunately bad ways to create artificial reefs. Uh, that is when the effort is not properly researched 
and it could lead to certain incidents uh, such as toxic paint being released into the water or even the material that was planned uh, that was uh, that, that's to be turned into an artificial reef if it's uh, too light it won't work out um so yeah artificial reefs would be awesome if it's properly researched also people currently are undertaking this an effort called coral fragmentation uh katie if you could move your angle to the, our coral fragments awesome thank you very much so friends what you are seeing right now are coral fragments or basically small pieces off of the top of a big coral which would eventually grow into a new coral um, a cool fact about corals is that they are capable of uh, cloning themselves so from a small piece they can grow into a new big coral now another effort that i wanted to highlight uh, that scientists are looking into would be to genetically modify mod modify corals in, in an attempt to find uh, coral species that are more resistant to the impacts of climate change that's something that i think that's something that would be cool to learn more about in the future um, hopefully we are successful in that effort now, in regards to tackling climate change, I did want to mention that um, I did want to mention a few ways to help out. Uh, first, uh, humanity, us humans as a group, we should try our best to move away from reliance on fossil fuel as soon as possible. Um, it doesn't mean that we should stop using fuel tomorrow or later or, or today. It just means that if we can slowly move away from fossil fuels, uh, slowly change our habits uh, and fossil fuels and its byproducts, actually, not just fossil fuels, uh, that would help out uh, in a big way, in a big way in the future. Um, also, I did want to mention that um, the biggest contri contributors to um, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, such as really big companies, we should try or, or they should try their best to be responsible as well. Uh, they should understand that they should uh, acknowledge their impacts to, the, o to uh, the ocean and to climate change and maybe try, try and look for ways for them to help out as well. Um, nowadays, it's through it's being pushed on us consumers or us individual people to uh, that, that all of the responsibility is on our shoulders. But that's just not the case. Uh, I mean, that is true partly, but also big companies would need to take some of the responsibility as well. Also, individually, there are some ways for us to help out with climate change or tackling climate change, such as. Um, I mentioned this earlier, but uh, uh, trying to change small things in our daily, in, in our habits, in our day-to-day -day life would help out in a big way. Say, for example, um, my first uh, example that I wanted to mention is that for people uh, who do not believe in climate change or is still iffy about climate change, to understand and accept that climate change is a real problem, that will go a long way. And also, if possible, um, if we could decrease our single-use plastic consumption, that would help out as well. Um, single-use plastics are a fossil fuel, fuel byproduct. They are made from fossil fuel. Um, and if we could decrease uh, our use of that, say, for example, our use of plastic bags or even plastic water bottles, um, that would help out in a big way. If you have your reusable tote bags or if you have your reusable mugs, that'll help out. If you bring them with you uh, as much as you can, that'll help out in a big way in the future. Um, and the last thing that I wanted to share, uh, and this is one thing that we like to mention a lot in the aquarium because this, this is true, this is, this is um, a good way to help out, is to share your knowledge so that we, so that we can help out with increasing awareness for, that, so that you can help out with increasing awareness. Um, the more we talk about these issues and the more we talk about how we can solve these issues, maybe more people can come together and help out, help with solving these issues in the future. Um, but that is it for me. I will end there. Fantastic. Well, thank you so, so much, Togi, and a neat opportunity to see some living coral and your amazing rainbow reef exhibit with those divers. Always a lot of fun. Uh, again, Ripley's Aquarium is open, so if you are in the general Toronto area, make sure you head there. Uh, amazing facility and uh, just a really special opportunity to see all sorts of wildlife from around the world. So we are going to dive in with questions in just a second, but what we're going to do first is do our Kahoot quiz. So I'm going to pull this up on my screen share. We already have 100 participants. I'd like to see many more in the next 30 seconds or so uh, before we get underway. And and then get those questions ready. Some of you have been asking questions and sharing questions in the chat bar already, which is awesome. If you haven't yet, get on ready. And then we are going to go to our live classes, of course, too. We are joined by classes from all over North America today, a lot in Ontario right near the aquarium, but many more as well. All right, 121 of you so far. 
Uh, I'm going to start this off. If you join after we begin, that is totally fine. For those new to Kahoot quizzes, about 20 seconds per question. The faster you answer, the more points you get. Awesome, guys. Let's dive in on Coral in Crisis with Ripley's Aquarium. All right. In three, two, one, we're beginning. And we can bring in Toki in the background, too. Maybe you can help us with some of these answers if people are, are having trouble. Coral is a <laughs> hmm, plant, animal, or lifeless rock. <laughs> Don't help them yet. I mean, we've got a little bit of nuance here, but I think <laughs> I hope that most of our audience has got this one. All right, I'm gonna put the game pin down below the screen. We've got four more seconds, guys. Four more seconds. 170 views. Everyone's answering. Awesome. All right. So most of you thought plant. The coral is in fact an animal related to a uh, They do have plants or zooxanthellae in their tissues, algae, but they are an animal. And the number one so far, Clever Duck's got our lead. Next question. Another quiz. Coral reefs make up how much of the ocean? Were you listening at the beginning of the program? One to two percent, five to ten percent, thirty percent, or all of it? Coral everywhere. You you can't even walk into the ocean because there's just so much coral. Don't you like now? 190 of you. Holy! 207 answers. You guys are almost at the all-time record for Kahoot for us, and you've passed it. Most Kahoot answers for any of our quizzes ever. So one to two percent. Very few of you got that one. Only eight people. It is a very very small percentage of the ocean, but it holds a lot of the biodiversity. So about 30 percent of all the species in the ocean live in these very small amount of coral reefs, which is why they're so important. All right. Question three. A lady gazelle's got the lead. When coral is stressed, it what does it do? Launders, implodes, bleaches, or goes supernova? Maybe ignore the picture on this one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I mean, that would be really metal, but awesome. But I don't think so, so I'm out. All right, 230 inches. Five more seconds, guys. This is awesome. Can we pay attention to the end? Let's see. And next, bleaches. Correct. Most of you got this one right. Way to go, guys. And Elena Gazelle sticks with the lead, 2880. Final question, guys. Let's see. All right, what can we do to protect corals? The end of the program. Are you all paying attention? Tell your friends, reduce carbon emissions, choose sustainable seafood. No, we didn't dive into that that much, but it might be a rule, or all the above. For those of you who've done Kahoot quizzes with me before, I, I stick with a very similar theme with these answers. Let's see how many of you think. Three more seconds left. 286, oh, almost 300. All of the above, that is correct. Telling your friends about conservation is a huge way to make a difference. Reduce carbon emissions, help reduce, reduce climate change, saves coral and all sorts of other species. And seafood means that you're not gonna rape those big nets along the bottom of the ocean to rip up coral. It's not something we address today, but it is important. All right, number one, our winner, Elena Gazelle, stuck with the lead from question two. I love it. Elena Gazelle, if you're in the YouTube chat, let me know who you are, which class you guys are. We'd love to hear from you. Awesome, guys. Thank you so much for that. That was a lot of fun. All right. I am going to go to uh, our live questions. Right now, I'm going to turn it over to Toki in a second. And uh, we're going to head to grade five, six with Miss Peck to kick us off in the question period. So come on up, Miss Peck, and take us away. Hey, guys. Hello. Hello. <laughs> How are you doing? Go ahead and ask your question, Emma. Where did the fish in your aquarium come from? That is a good question. Um, so there are different sources. There are multiple sources for our fish. For our smaller ones, they come from the aquarium itself and from other aquariums that we are connected with. We are. Um, we are a part of AZA and CAZA. Uh, we basically are groups of aquariums that are um, regulated, that are under a certain standard, basically. Um, and we, um, and yeah, basically, we'd get some of our fish from them. Also, sometimes from uh, the Toronto Zoo. Uh, a, a good example is from one of our recent exchanges with the Toronto Zoo. Uh, we traded with them our freshwater stingrays because we because we had an excess of freshwater stingrays, and they traded with us in return um, pot-bellied seahorses. Um, aside from getting it from other aquariums and from growing, from raising the smaller uh, the, the smaller fish in the aquarium itself, uh, the we get cases or there are cases where some of our uh, animals are donated to us. Say for example, with some of our blue lobsters, 
funny story. Um, some of our blue lobsters were actually donated to us one day when we opened. We just uh, on in on, on our doorstep a box that can, we saw a box containing blue lobsters. Uh, the story behind it is apparently uh, the restaurant owner felt bad about cooking the, or using the blue lobster, and they de decided to donate the blue lobster to the aquarium. Um, we also have some rescue animals here at the aquarium. Um, our two green sea turtles, Spot and Chewy. Uh, they were rescued from a food farm, and then when, when Spot and Chewy needed a permanent home, we didn't have sea turtles at the time, so we could take care of them. And for our big animals, such as our big sharks, our same tiger sharks, we got it off of the coast of Florida, I believe, uh, at, the Atlantic, uh, at that part of the Gulf, uh, the Gulf of uh, the Atlantic Ocean, off of the coast of Florida. Now, before we do decide to take an animal from the ocean, there are also um, regulations that we need to follow. We need to make sure that we're getting the right size of the animal, the right, uh, 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 the right uh, gender or sex of the animal. Uh, we need to go through certain regulations to make sure that we're doing our part and that we're not harming the ocean any further. But that yes. Was, that was a very thoughtful and thorough answer, Toby. Thank you for that. Um, I did want to stress and highlight what you mentioned at the beginning of that, which is CAZA in Canada and AZA accreditation. So this is a, a system whereby uh, a governing body of all the best zoos and aquariums in the world basically come to a facility and make sure that they are at the highest standards of animal care. So what you can do at home, wherever you're joining from around the world today, is whenever you go to a zoo or aquarium, make sure they have this accreditation. It means that the animals are well cared for, they're healthy, they're happy. Uh, it's a really important thing to make sure that you're making those sort of choices when you're going to facilities with animals so that you don't end up in a situation where animals are being mistreated in any way. So Ripley's Aquarium, highest possible standard of animal care. They brush their coral every day. It's amazing. Um, and so I, I really hope you guys get the chance to check that out. Great question to kick us off, guys. All right, Ms. Ross's class in Tavistock, come on in, guys, and take us away. Hello. Hello. Hi. <laughs> um, okay, so one of my questions is about how much venom does coral release? So that's a good question. Um, corals, they actually make chemicals in their body that helps them with, uh, uh, with protecting themselves from animals, unwanted animals that would want to hurt them, hurt them or harm them. Also, sometimes they would use this, these chemicals to have little fights with other corals that are nearby. It sounds funny, but it's true. Um, these, uh, these, the, the venom that corals have, um, I do not know for certain as to how much they have. I would think based on their size, since polyps are very small, it would be a small amount, minuscule, microscopic. I think if a person were to touch a coral, we won't probably even feel any pain at all. It might feel a bit itchy. Um, but yeah, I guess that's how I would answer your question. I do not know, but based on their size, I would say a small amount. Yeah, great question, guys. It's the first time we've ever got that one of our Coral programs before. All right, Miss Woodland, grade 10s in Belleville, our, our one high school group today. Uh, come on in, guys, and take us away. Do you have a question for us? Uh, what, are, what are the effects of ocean currents on coral reefs? Oh, crap. Um, I heard you ask, what are the effects of ocean currents and coral reefs? That's a good question. Um, with uh, when you when fr friends when you learn more about ocean currents, you'll learn about this thing called an upwelling. An upwelling is basically when um, cold water that is carrying a lot of nutrients uh, hits, say for example, uh, a shelf. I, I guess a continental shelf, which would push the cold water upwards. Um, that's why it's called upwelling. Anyway, um, this upwelling it has since it has a lot of nutrients. Uh, you would, normal or scientists have found that corals that grow along the equator, the uh, corals closer to the equator, they would grow in areas where there's a lot of upwelling because that's where there's a lot of nutrients. Um, a cool fact or an interesting fact is that with climate change, it can affect the currents. It, it can potentially affect ocean currents. It can potentially change the ocean currents and how they, how currents are flowing now, right now. Um, so yeah, uh, I guess to answer your question, it has a big effect. It can be a, a good source of nutrient for corals, nutrition for corals. And once climate change changes these, uh, if climate change does change ocean currents, then it might be a disaster for corals right now. Yes, great question, guys. And by the way, so nice when we get grade 10s and above asking questions. I know it's a lot. <laughs> we appreciate it when high schoolers join in the programs. All right, let's head to YouTube for a quick minute, and then we're going to head to our other three live classes. Ms. Arkan's class wants to know, how valuable are coral reefs to the ocean ecosystems, and would oceans be okay without coral? Um, they, I would say, and uh, 
the, I, at this point, I don't think this is a, this is a debate, but um, coral reefs are detrimental to the ocean ecosystem. Um, uh, since they are, since corals provide food and shelter, they are at. The, I would say that they are uh, at the base. Say, for example, in the pyramid, they would be at the base. And if we take corals out of the out of the ocean ecosystem in the overall ocean. Um, the ocean could collapse, um, and it's not just the ocean that would collapse. Even um, it would have an impact on all the other ecosystems on land that are especially close to the ocean, but also even those ecosystems that are far away from the ocean. Um, like I mentioned earlier, we have. It's easy to believe that uh, ecosystem, or it's easy to seem that it's easy to think that ecosystems are not connected at all, but they are all connected. Um, and when one ecosystem feel, feel or experiences a certain amount of pressure, eventually all the other ecosystems that are connected will feel that pressure as well. Yeah. I mean, it's dire, but you did highlight in your program a lot of the ways that people can take action to protect corals. So it's been really nice to see the scientific establishment and people around the world really working to protect these you know, fragile ecosystems. Same with rainforests on land, grasslands. A lot of the ecosystems that really underpin what we do as a society. We are starting to have a, a sort of vast public consciousness around the importance of protecting them. Great question, guys. All right, Miss Theobald's class, uh, St. John Catholic, if you guys want to come up for a question, go for it. Hey, guys. Um, we actually have two. So we have, uh, what will happen if more coral reefs start to die? And what's the second? Do a lot of people know what's happening on coral? Yeah. Mm. Uh, these are good questions. What will happen when more coral starts to die? Um, I've been hinting at this throughout the presentation, but the ocean will be, get, will be in trouble, uh, will be in trouble, all the marine life in the ocean will be in trouble, and even us humans will, other ecosystems on land will be in trouble as well, but also us humans. Um, I didn't mention this earlier, but as humans, we also get other things from the ocean um, and, for, and uh, from corals, not just the ocean. Um, a lot of the phytoplankton or the algae that are in the ocean, and that includes the algae that you would find or the phytoplankton that you would find in a coral reef, they produce a lot of oxygen, um, about 70, 50 to 80% of oxygen in our atmosphere, the breathable oxygen that's available for us. You mentioned other animals on land would come from the ocean, so that's very important. Um, also, us humans, we get a lot of, we get medicine. We actually extract medicine from corals. We get medicine from corals and the chemicals that they have in their body. Um, that, we would lose that if uh, corals disappear. Um, uh, and also, uh, the second question, are people aware that this is a problem? Yeah. Uh, yeah, people are aware that this is a problem. Uh, mostly people that live, or right now, people that live closer or at least in the past few years, people that live closer to the ocean or to in coastlines along the coast, they are really they are very aware of this problem. Um, they have more awareness of this problem. Uh, people inland, uh, they it, it, they have not, or if they've heard of it, they haven't focused on this problem a lot because it's very far away from them. People seem to think that since the, or a lot of people inland seem to think that since the ocean is very far away from them, whatever happens to the ocean will not affect them but that's actually not the case like i've been saying all throughout the presentation um so yeah i would say a few years ago a few people or not a lot of people are aware of this problem or if they are aware of it they don't care that much now awareness is increasing which is actually awesome um right now we just need to we need the help of our government to take action uh not just our government but every uh, government all over the world because this is a world worldwide problem Fantastic, Toki. And again, I, again, your whole point of the presentation today was to highlight this and how special these ecosystems are. I hope you guys have really grasped that and, and you got a chance to see some baby coral too, which is adorable. So that makes it even better. Um, but yeah, this is something that we can all take action on and we can all vote for. Again, one of the things I've been stressing in climate presentations this week is regardless of your political persuasion uh, with the recent election, Climate change, the climate change plan of the, the party that won was ranked really, really fantastic by some of the world's top climate scientists. So we are starting to take action. We're voting to help make sure that the, the world will be protected, coral reefs will be protected on a global scale. And so I think that's a really important message to get in today. All right, guys, we've got time for two more questions. We are time flies and you're having fun. I'm gonna head to Ms. Wilson's class. Uh, come on in and unmute your mic. So Ms. Wilson's class is joining us today in Walkerton. Welcome in guys and take us away. So how big of a change can a couple degrees in ocean temperature make? Uh, 
That's a good question. Um, and with what we can see, and it's really hard because all uh, things that are underwater, it's hard for us humans to see above ground. Uh, but from things that we can see, it might not have a, a big impact. But for um, for the microorganisms that are living in the ocean, for the smaller organisms that are uh, usually they would be the base or would be would play a big role as food for as a source of food for other bigger animals in the ocean. It could be um, I would. Um, hazard to say it could be deadly for them. Um, for a lot of the phytoplankton that are in the ocean, um, and also the um, zoo, the zooxanthellae or the algae that are living in the tissues of these corals, um, it can be deadly for them, these small changes. Um, and again, it might not seem like it's big for us because it's really hard to see what's underneath the ocean, but it can have really big impacts. I'm so glad you mentioned that. I'm so glad we talked about the impact of a very small amount of, of temperature rise. So again, one degree, two degrees, it doesn't sound like a lot, but spread over the entire climate system, we get huge impacts. We're at about one degree rise right now. And I encourage all our students, ask your teachers, ask your parents how much the climate has changed locally where you are. I'm 29 and it is radically different in Toronto where I grew up than it was when I was a kid. The winters are shorter, uh, summer are hotter, there's more big rain events, more big storm events. It's something that's happened in 20 years and there's a really radical change. And so as we continue to increase temperature rise, we're going to see more and more of these changes around the globe as you guys see on the news. Of course, every single season now, which is a really odd situation for the world to have that sort of thing and the level of these storms and it's so many other impacts. So great question. Guys, uh, we've got time for one more question. I wish I could take more from you too, but what I do want to stress before we go to our last live question, if you want to learn more about the amazing work Ripley's is doing, if you want to ask them more questions, their site is incredible, ripleysaquariums.com uh, slash Canada. They are doing virtual field trips still. They've been doing this all since COVID began. They are open to the public now, but if you want to check out more about their virtual offerings, virtual field trips, all sorts of great stuff, head to their website and find out more. Again, you can share questions with the team there. Go to the facility itself and learn more about some of these, these things that you want to know and uh, keep the excitement going. One other thing I want to stress, when you're done this broadcast, my favorite thing in nature is coral spawning or coral breeding, laying eggs. Look up a video of that when you're done. It's like fireworks underwater. It's pure magic. Uh, I know we're talking about some big issues today, but I think uh, the love of the natural world underpins all of what we're trying to do for conservation. If you watch that video, I guarantee you will fall in love or as much, uh, nearly as much in love uh, with the natural world as I am. All right, one more question. Miss Parrish's class joining us for the first time in Petroleum. How many species of fish do you think have in the Pacific Ocean? Ah, we got this question a lot on YouTube too. <laughs> um, that's a good question. So throughout the aquarium, there are somewhere between 4,000 to 5,000 different species or different types. Uh, most of those are actually from the small, are, are actually the smaller fish. We have a lot of really small fish. Um, if you were wondering how, what that would translate to in total numbers, uh, we have somewhere around 16,000 animals throughout the aquarium. Very, very cool. You guys are the largest aquarium in, in like indoor aquarium in Canada, correct? Yes, yes largest indoor aquarium, yes. Yeah, we got a few of some outdoor stuff going on, but Ripley's is truly amazing. Uh, short, silver head, steam race. This is just one of the many programs we've done with them. And if you check out our YouTube channel, at Exploring by the Sea of Your Pants, you'll actually see like 30 plus past broadcasts and everything from seahorses to those sea turtles, shark feeding, so much more. Uh, it's always a real pleasure to have them join us. So guys, before we bring back in Toki and bring in all your classes to say a big thank you and goodbye, I did want to note again, if you are new to us at Exploring by the Sea of Your Pants, check out our website, register for our newsletter. We've got another 15, 20 20 programs in September alone, not to mention 50 more coming up in October where we dive in on space exploration. This is all part of Science Literacy Week. ScienceLiteracy.ca will highlight all the virtual and in-person events happening across the country, and we are doing this in association with the Canadian Association of Science Editors for our Week of Wonders. This is program, what is this program? This is nine of 20. Uh, we've got a lot more coming up today, a lot more on Thursday and Friday, so I hope you can join us for even more. Thank you guys so, so much for being a part of today's program. And Toki, thank you for being such a great host and highlighting so much on Coral. Uh, this is a fantastic presentation today. Uh, you're welcome, Jesse. Thank you for having us. It's always fun talking to, or, or reaching out to as many, as many people as we can to Exploring by the Seat of your Paints. Now we've got our six live classes, I think at least 10 more on YouTube, so hundreds and hundreds of kids across the continent. And as you know what we do to end every broadcast, I'm going to bring in all our live classes to join me in saying a big thank you and farewell. So Miss Woodland, Miss Peck, Miss Ross, Miss Theobald, Miss Wilson, Miss Parrish, come on in and join me. Thank you guys so much.